Good morning, church. Good morning. I see I catch you a little bit surprised here, so we're going to do it again. Good morning, church. Good morning. I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of God. It's good to be in God's house on this his holy Sabbath. Amen? we got to understand that we serve a mighty God. Amen? I'd like to welcome us to the greater round of Seventh-day Adventist Church today. And I trust and hope that as we worship here today, that we may all enjoy the love that God has for us. If you're here for the first time today, this is your first time in the church. Could you just raise your hand? Okay, I need somebody with a mic um, so I can embarrass some of these people. Raise your hand if you're here for the first time. Testing, test. I'd like you to tell us your name, where you're from, and how you plan to spend the rest of your life here with us at Greater Randall. <laughs> um, my mom comes here. My name is Stephanie Napolis. This is my son, Duke. Um, I, we're actually from San Antonio. Um, I'm a teacher, so I guess that's how I... Oh, I don't know how I plan on spending my life here, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you. <laughs> okay, get him a good mic. I got you. Oh, my name is Desmond Watson. I'm here with my mom and my sister. And remember, I'm stationed at um, Bamsi. We are originally from Ghana. And we've been here for um, three years. We didn't know we have like a church. So we always go to Houston. Uh, to uh, worship with them. So right now that we found a church that is close by, uh, we would love to come here and worship with you. Church, did you, did you hear that? They would love to come here and worship. Okay. Uh, we have some seats, okay? We have a few seats, so you're welcome to come and worship with us anytime. Amen? Anyone else? Been here for the first time. There's a lady over there. I think she raised her hand. She probably think I didn't see her, but. Um, hello, my name is Ashley George. Um, I've been here since 2017. I'm a pharmacist at Bamsey. Um, I just felt like coming to church today. Amen. Excited. Amen. That's good. That's all right. That's all right. She does feel like coming to church today, and she's here. I trust and hope that as we all worship today, that we may enjoy the love that God has for us. I'll leave her to guests at front for later introduction. Um, also, there are no family to us, but um, the Hortons are here. Sister, um, Sister Yolanda and, and, and Casper Horton is here. And the reason why I'm picking them out is that uh, they're the newly installed pastor for the Seguin Valley View and Emmanuel Church. They were installed last Sabbath, so I think they're hoping for us to pray for them as they take up this new challenge that God has called them to be. Uh, uh, so as a church, let us pray for them as they take on this new challenge. Uh, I realize they, they, they move from two churches to, to three churches. So, uh, so but it is good to, to have you, and we'll pray and for you that as you go into this new adventure, that um, you will surrender your life to God completely so that he can use you in a mighty way. Church, today we have um, a special program for you today. So I pray that as we sit back and we listen, that we will get some information. And as I always say, um, we're not only here to get information, but um, let us allow the information to transform us and transform our lives so that we can be better Christians and better servants for God. Amen? And this time I'll ask us to call, I mean, to stand for the call to worship. It says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. 
For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. The church is now called to worship. You may be seated. Good morning again, church. It's, um, it's time for us to praise the Lord. All right. I didn't hear much amen. Are yeah, you happy to be here in the house of the Lord? All right. Let us, I believe our first song is number 73. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Let us stand for the first song. Holy, holy. Six, a mighty fortress is our God. Yeah. 
touches me and merciful Father. How for this very moment we thank you for being here and allow us to be in your presence. We ask you to bless us, bless the speaker, and as we go through the rest of this day, bless the program. Lord, help us to understand and may we leave here better than when we came in. We ask for your love, your grace, and your blessing. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Happy Sabbath, church family. That's better. Both in house and online. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Now, who last week knew that they would be here today? Okay. So we know it's a gift from God. Will the congregation please stand? Let's show the Lord how thankful we are for his 
abundant gifts. We'll sing today hymn number 346. If it doesn't just appear on the screen, can we get our hymnals, please? Let us show the Lord how glad and happy we are to be in his house. come forth to collect the morning tithes and offerings. Gifts every day. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. How would human beings live if the gifts and blessings of heaven were not constantly flowing to them? God gives constantly, and humans may give constantly. There is no time when gifts and offerings should not come in accordance with the resources which God has provided. It is our own money that we are angling. No, pardon. Is it our own money that we are handling? It is God's, and his work cannot advance unless 
treasury is applied, supplied by gifts and offerings. God has lent us means that we may return his own to him. And if we faithfully do our duty, there will always be enough for home and for admissions. All that we do is to be done willingly. We are to bring our offerings with joy and gratitude. The most costly service we can render is but meager compared to the gifts of God to our world. Christ is a gift every day. God gave him to the world and he graciously takes the gifts entrusted to his human agents for the advancement of his work in the world. Thus, we show that we recognize and acknowledge that everything belongs to God absolutely and entirely. God calls upon us to labor us together with him. This is the message that he sends to us through various means. The truth is to be presented to those who know not God. The Bible is to be read to those who will hear it. The Holy Spirit cooperates with him who opens the scriptures to others. The minister, who is a true shepherd, gives the word to the people. He engages earnestly in personal labor and makes supplication to God. This is all the human agent can do. He sows the seed, but he knows not which shall prosper, either this or that. But God giveth the increase. He draws, he leads, he searches the heart. Work must be done at home and in the regions beyond. This work requires God's entrusted money. Those who are fully converted are under obligation to do a work which requires money and consecration. The Lord does not prosper. The Lord does not propose to come to this world and lay down gold and silver. It is not returning to God his entrusted gifts that makes individuals poor. Withholding them tends to poverty. For great, for the one purpose above all others for which God's gifts should be used is the sustaining of workers in the great harvest field. Please bring the tithes and offerings into the store of, of the Lord. Please stand. We give thee but thine own, what here thy gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone, I trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the offerings that we give, gave today. May it be from our hearts, Lord, and Lord, may it be enough to go out, to go in all the corners of the world, as we heard from the pastor this morning, to reach the unreached, Lord. And as we see the difficulties, dear Father, and we are here in comfort, Help us, dear Lord, to go above and beyond to help to spread the word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. This thought I leave with us today. Tithe is returned. Offerings are given. How generous are we with God?
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Everyone settled? Yes, you ready? Did everyone have a good week? Yes. Anything exciting happened this week? What happened? World Church and Eli was going to Pathfinders. I said, tell my brother we went out together. That's wonderful. That is something exciting. What else? My teacher got happy because we were playing um, church at recess. Oh, teachers. That's a good thing when teachers get happy. <laughs> yes. I get to be a Pathfinder now. Woohoo! Eli is a Pathfinder. God be praised. All right. Well, it sounds like you had some fun and exciting things going on this week. And I want to share something with you. Okay. And I have a lot of questions. Can you give me some answers, you think? Yes, you have some answers in your brain. All right. Well, my first question, I know you know this. What does it mean to be obedient? What does it mean? Look at those hands. It means to be, to listen to your parents when and they speak to you. Being obedient is when um, there are, um, like when your teacher gives you instructions, you have to follow them. Very good. You need to be obedient to your parents, to your teachers. Yes. You got to be obedient in the sanctuary with no yelling, no running. Very good. Now, do you always have to be obedient? Yes. We would all agree we always have to be obedient. Now, why do you think you have to be obedient? Why do you think you always should be obedient? Because it's the right thing to do. Yes, it's the right thing to do. Because you can go to heaven by being obedient. Say that very loud, Zandy. You can go to heaven by being obedient. You can go to heaven when you are obedient. Well, let me ask you this. What happens if you don't obey your parents? What will happen if you don't obey them? Um, we'll give you some thinking time. We'll come back to you, okay? It's okay. It's all right. What happens if you don't obey your parents? You get in trouble. You get in trouble, right? What else? Teaching puts you in the trap. Okay, we're going we're gonna to put you in the trap? Okay, we're going to move on from that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> And I'm a mandatory reporter, so we can move on, okay? When you don't listen, you might not go to heaven. Uh-huh, very good. It's okay. It's okay, baby. You can get punished. You can get punished. All right, well, listen up. Listen up. Now, there you go. It's okay. Just like you, eyes up here, she's okay. She's all right. I want you to listen. Put on your listening ears. Thank you. Just like you as children have to obey parents, everyone, including children, also have to obey God. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now, let me ask you this. Um, when you are disobedient to your parents, do they give you a warning before you receive a consequence for disobeying? Yes, they give you a warning, right? Yeah. Why do you think they give you a warning? Why do you think they'll give you a warning? So you can know you're doing something wrong and you can fix it. Very good. So you know you're doing something wrong and you can fix it. Now, did you know that God always gives the world a warning before giving the consequence for disobeying his law or his commandments? Yes. Now, do you know where you can find this warning in the Bible? Do you know where? Anybody? It's okay if you don't know. Everything God wants us to know is in the Bible. And this warning is found in Revelation 14, verse 6 through 11. It's called the three angels message. And it's, in the, it's that message because it was a message that is carried by God's angels. Have you ever heard about the three angels message? Yes. Now, who do you think the angels are giving this warning to? Is it just to little boys and little girls? No. Who do you, to, oh, you are so smart. To the entire world. The message goes to the whole world 
warning everyone that God's judgment is soon to come. Now, the angels, the uh, message um, tells us to worship the creator and give glory only to who? Only to God. Now, it also warns us that Babylon, which is a false form of worship, is falling. And we don't want to be a part of that, right? No, we don't. So if you worship the beast, you will experience God's wrath, which is a consequence for um, not obeying him. So he gives us a warning, just like your parents give you a warning before you um, get a consequence, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to rem always remember to be obedient to God, also to your parents. And when you are given a warning, what should you do when you're given a warning? Obey it. Obey it, right? What else could you do? Listen. Listen. Listen and do the right thing. Very good. <clears throat> no. Know that you're doing it something wrong and always make sure you try not to do that wrong thing ever again. Very good. You guys are smart boys and girls. So we want to remember that we want to obey God, his warnings, and we want to obey our parents. Now I have something for you. In the book of Revelation that I talked about, there's a lot of different things in that book. Lots of different information. And so I want you to Take this home, or you can do it later on today. And this is a crossword puzzle or a word search. Word search, right? Yes, a word search. And it has all the themes of Revelation. And I'm going to ask some of you to read these things, okay? I'm going to give you one. Everyone will get one, honey. Everyone's going to get one. Give her one of those. Now, look at this paper. I want you to read, tell me what you see on there. Hold on. I want you to read them. Hold on just a second. There you go. Give your brother the other one. All right. I want you to read. Tell me some of the things that you see on there. Seven churches. Seven churches. What else do you see? I see seven plagues. Seven plagues. Beast. Beast, yes. What else can you tell me you see on there? What else do you see? Do you see new earth? New heaven? Second coming? Babylon? Seven seals? Two witnesses, beast, dragon, false prophet. These are some of the themes that are in the book of Revelation. So when you, as you're doing this activity, I want you to ask your parents to explain to you what are some of these things that are in the book of Revelations. I guarantee you will be a great study and you'll learn a lot. Okay? All right. Who wants to pray? Somebody? Have it? <laughs> okay. One person. Okay. Come on, Lily. Let's bow our heads, close your eyes, and put your eyes, put your mind on Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for this lovely day. Thank you for everything you gave us. Please help everybody who need money. Please help to have your Holy Spirit by them, God. Please send all the angels to ever people, God. And please help every every little girl or little boy to have so much fun and know your love, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can go back to your seats. Good? Okay. I'm sorry. It is time now for scripture reading. 
I believe it will be shown on the screen. Yes. Jeremiah, let us all stand. And I will be reading. It's found in an Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, said the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bring blessings to our hearts from reading of his word. Amen. And we will just continue with our congregational prayer our intercessory prayer now and before i read the requests i would like to share a few thoughts from the spirit of prophecy what is actually a prayer why do we pray from steps to christ it says prayer is the opening of the heart to god as to a friend another quotation says prayer does not bring us down prayer does not bring God down to us but bring us up to him prayer is the breath of soul it is the secret of spiritual power and the last quotation from the steps to Christ says prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse we are treasured by the boundless resources of omnipotence amen and I have here a few prayer requests that came. And I'm going to read them here before we go down on our knees. It says, please pray for Bible study student Kelly. She's going through a lot. Please keep her in prayer. Then we have another request here. A Bible student received his first Bible. He cried so much and was thankful. Keep Doyle in your prayers. Please pray for Sister Gladys Webb to feel stronger and have more energy. Please pray for Daniel and Sister Didi, my son and my daughter. And I'll add for my daughter, uh, Talita, my wife, Didi, and my son, Daniel. They are a little bit under the weather, They're, but they'll be well soon. Please pray for Albert Green and the test he will be starting on Monday and Tuesday. Does anyone have a silent request? You may raise your hand. Amen. God knows what's in your heart. So if you're able to kneel, let's kneel before the majesty of heaven and if you're not able you may remain seated our heavenly father we come to you in the name of jesus to ask please first for forgiveness of our sins that there is nothing now that is between us and you that you may cleanse us with the blood of Jesus Christ who is interceding for us now in the heavenly sanctuary receive these humble prayers of faith I ask now that all the names that are mentioned here you know each individual case we may know all we may not know all the details but you do know that you please forgive of their sins and that you please bring these individuals your blessings that your will may be done. And when strength is needed to trial and tribulation, that you may give. When peace is needed, you promise that you will give peace. And at the end, that your name will be glorified, that your will be done. 
and not our. That everything that comes to us may come from your hand. You will allow things to happen and you can prevent things from happening. But like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. And uh, welcome to Greater Randolph again. And uh, just want to welcome those who are online, on Facebook, and also on YouTube watching. You're also welcome. Uh, this morning, I have the privilege and the honor to uh, introduce our speakers uh, this morning. We are blessed to have them at home. So I have a lot of questions I asked last night. And also, I'm going to ask him again maybe tonight before he goes to sleep because... It's once in a lifetime you get uh, Dr. Vine to come along. So uh, we're going to use the best. And today you have questions in the afternoon, so it has a good opportunity today for you to take advantage of it. And also, um, Pastor Leno, um, it was a last-minute decision, but we also welcome you here as well. And I think I will leave his biography for Dr. Vine to do because he knows more about him. I didn't have a, a printout uh, for him as yet. So let me go ahead and just uh, introduce uh, Dr. Vine. Born in a pastoral family, Elder Vine grew up with his twin brother and two sisters in homes across the UK. After graduating with a business management degree in 1995, he served in the U UK public health care system before God led him to Adra in 1996. Initially serving in Azerbaijan, Elder Vine served with Adra through 2002 in various roles worldwide. Following seminary training at Newbold New College in 2002 to 2004, he and Luda began their pastoral ministry in London, UK. After serving as secretary treasurer in the Middle East Union, they transitioned to pastoral ministry for four years in Minnesota before Elder Vine answered the call to serve as president of Adventist Frontier Missions. And the website is also, um, front. we have some information. We have a desk outside if you need more information. But the website is uh, afmonline.org. So before you leave, we have some materials outside on the table in case you want to uh, donate uh, in whatever form you may uh, online outside. And Conrad and Luda were married in December of 1999 and regard their marriage uh, and their two children as a personal blessing from a loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Uh, we welcome uh, Pastor uh, Leno and Pastor Vine here as well. But before they come up and uh, do their presentation, we're going to be blessed with some music, uh, special music by uh, the Joseph family. Amen? Uh, and the next word you're going to have after that is Pastor Vine and Pastor Leno as well. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, we have a special music this morning, and it's entitled Coming Soon. And who is here that coming soon? Have we been prepared? Are we already? But one thing I do know ready or not ready, prepared or prepared, he's coming. Coming soon, Jesus in all his glory, not just a Savior, but a reigning King. Coming soon, and the whole world will be with 
will be ready for His coming soon. Once again, to this old world of sin and sorrow, there are children in the lion's and land with me. All the earth will be so filled with His presence. Great kings of earth, we bow and worship His great name. Coming soon, Jesus in all His glory, not just a Savior, but a reigning King. Soon, and the whole world will be witness. Oh, be ready for his coming soon. When he comes, he'll find the powers of all Satan. Little children. With the lamb and lion will play. All the earth will be so filled with his glory. No need for crying, for all tears are wise away. Coming soon, Jesus. In all his glory, not just a savior, but a reigning king. Coming soon, and the whole world will be witness. Oh, be ready for his coming soon. Coming soon, Jesus in all his glory, not just a Savior, but a reigning King. Coming soon, and the whole world will be with me. Oh, be ready for Jesus, Jesus is coming soon. Amen, yes. <clears throat> I make a joyful noise, they make a harmonious noise. There's a big difference. Brother and sister Joseph, that was a blessing. Oh, when Jesus comes soon, it really is the blessed hope, yes? We look at the mess we're making of our world with all our technology and all our wisdom and all our wealth. We just seem to be going from bad to worse. And so the only hope for us is really the coming of Jesus. And so we look forward to that as Adventists. We don't just live in the receding shadows of the cross. We, look, we live in the, the increasing light of the dawn of the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we don't just look back, we look forward. And, you know, if you look at um, a cross, we have, oh yeah, we have a cross here. Um, you notice that every Catholic church has Jesus on the cross. So known as crucifix, because in Catholic theology, uh, by his wounds, we are healed. They're, they're, the wounds of Jesus are redemptive. And in a Protestant church, Jesus is never on the cross because he is risen and he's coming again. And so it's a privilege to come and share with you this morning. Thank you, Sister and Brother Joseph. And uh, I bring greetings from my wife. Um, I have one wife and uh, I have one mother-in-law, and that's a blessing. And she lives in Moscow, Russia, um, which is a blessing as well. You know, she was threatening to come in 2018, 2019, then COVID struck. 
and she couldn't visit. And then when the COVID pandemic went over, there was war in Ukraine, so she still can't come. So, you know, there are silver linings to every cloud, you might say. But uh, anyway, I bring greetings from my, my family up in Barron Springs, Michigan. You know, God moves in mysterious ways. You know, I fly a lot, and I always go in coach. I always sit at the back of the plane somewhere. And yesterday I said, Lord, I said, I've got to give three sermons up in um, Sandpoint Church in Northern Idaho in a couple of Sabbaths' time. And the next two weeks are really intense. So I just don't have time to write anything. And, um, and so I said, Lord, I was driving to the airport. He said, Lord, I said, I just need to sit in business class today. Why? Because I can have tight space to put my laptop up and do some working on it. And I get to the airport. And I get this old text from United saying, you've been upgraded. Now, I've never upgraded on a, on a morning flight like that. And I got a text yesterday say, you're upgraded if you're a return flight to Chicago. And, oh, thank you, Lord. I need to be writing more sermons because I seem to get upgrades uh, as a, uh, because of the need for just to sit with a laptop for three hours somewhere. So anyway, I bring greetings from my family. Uh, it's, been, it's a privilege to travel down with Pastor Numa and his wife and the family are back in Berrien Springs. And um, I'd like to say thank you to Brother Norville and your family for your gracious hosting of us last night. Brother Ricardo has been texting me and texting me for the best part of maybe a year now, I guess. And um, so it was nice to meet him finally in person to spend the evening with his family. And uh, so um, today is a, is, a, is a beautiful day here. We're glad to welcome our guests here. Some of you are here for the first time. Uh, some of you are regular members. Um, but whoever you are and wherever you come from, we come into the house of God because we want to hear God speak to our hearts. Is that not right? We come to the house of God, not because we primarily want to come and see friends or family, but because we live in a troubled world and we know that the voices around us are all speaking lies, but God's worth is truth. And uh, Jesus is truth and his word is truth. And we want to hear the truth of God spoken to our hearts because we want to know how to live our lives and to chart a straight course in the midst of stormy waters. So today we're coming together. Not to hear a preacher, not to hear some singers, not to hear a teacher of a Sabbath school class. But we come into the house of God because we're hoping to hear the voice of God speak to our hearts. So let's bow our heads and invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, there are many voices and many words in our world. And the bottom line is, Father, out of a faulty human being, you cannot get, any, some, and get anything that is absolutely true. Well, the only thing we have in our lives that is absolutely true is the Word of God. And so, Lord, I ask that this morning you still the voices of this world, the voices we've heard during this week, angry voices, doubting voices, accusing voices, impatient voices, lying voices. I'm asking this morning, Father, that the spirit of truth will be heard in this pulpit this morning. Father, give us minds that are ready to be transformed and renewed. Father, give us hearts that are willing to be turned from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Father, give us wisdom that we might know the paths we are to tread in the coming week. Father, give us a renewed desire to have your love flow through us in new and beautiful ways in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, and with those we love and serve. So, Father, speak through me, speak for me. I pray you'll bless those in this house of worship today. For those watching online, we pray for the special presence of your Holy Spirit in their homes or in their laptops, wherever they're watching. And, Father, may all that is said and done in this house of worship bring honor and glory to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So when I was growing up, um, I used to, and I was raised in a pastoral family. My, most of the churches grew up in were actually Jamaican churches. And we used to live in the North England Conference, and we go to Jamaican churches, uh, mostly people from the islands, as we say here in America. And uh, I learned all about Jamaican patties and Jamaican ginger cake and playing of dominoes on Sabbath nights and smacking down the dominoes with little brass knuckles on them. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, sister. And I learned about what it was to be called and chosen and faithful in a hostile land. Because for our church members living in a society that did not want people from Jamaica in it, uh, the church was a place of refuge. It was a place where you could celebrate your humanity, where people whose society said you're not worth anything could express their gifts in a God-given way. And the church was an island of sanity in the midst of a hostile, hostile world. 
And as I grew up in that environment, I realized that uh, we read these heroes of faith in the Bible. We read about Esther, the young girl. The young girl went before the king at the risk of her life. We read of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. Uh, we think of the three worthy Hebrews standing before Nebuchadnezzar and that fiery and the, the, the statue of gold and the fiery furnace. And I used to imagine growing up that maybe God was going to call me or any of us here today to a role like Daniel, so that one day I may go into the lion's den, but God's going to haul me out. Or like the three Hebrews, I'm going to be thrust into a fiery furnace, but God is going to redeem me and set me free at the end of the day. That's what I fondly imagine. And as I've grown older, and you might say grayer, sadder, and wiser, I realize that maybe God is calling us not so much to be like uh, the prophet Daniel, but maybe the prophet Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah was a prophet who lived just before the day of the Lord for God's people in Judah, just before the promised judgment from Babylon upon God's people living in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah was a prophet for over 40 years. And the bottom line was this. He didn't turn anybody's hearts to God. Everybody knew he was a prophet, but nobody listened to him. And uh, when he said, if you do not turn back to God, the Babylonians would come. They didn't turn back to God, and the Babylonians did come. And they destroyed Jerusalem once, twice, and thrice. And uh, they didn't listen to him. And so he was, a, he was a man who experienced cancel culture, who experienced the hatred of his own people. And yet he was faithful to God. And we're living before this world's, what the Bible calls the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. That is the second coming of Jesus. And we sing about the second coming of Jesus, but when Jesus comes again, not only are the, the, the righteous who died in the past called forth from their voice by the voice of the archangel and trumpet of God, but the wicked are slain by the glory of his coming, and the wealthy and the powerful and the kings and the magnates of this earth who've built bunkers for themselves in southern Texas, in the mountains of Oklahoma and Colorado, they're going to be hiding in their bunkers, cry, they're crying on the rocks to save them from the face of the one who sits upon the throne as he comes in glory. And we read in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15, not in the second half of the chapter, we read about the resurrection of the righteous. But in the first half of 1 Corinthians 15, we read that when Jesus comes again, the, the, the powers and authorities of evil will be destroyed by the glory of his coming. Now, that's good news. You know, I say, burn, baby, burn for all those demons and, and uh, fallen angels. It's good news that Satan will burn. So when we proclaim the second coming of Jesus, we are proclaiming death to all demons out there. And all forces that have oppressed and caused injustice will be dealt with once and for all. So uh, the proclamation of the second coming of Jesus is a rebuke to the spirits. And it's saying to them, your time is coming up. Your end is sure. There will be a time when you will be dead and you will trouble fallen humanity no more. And so the prophet Jeremiah spoke for 40 years, or you go from time, he was a teenager, all the way through to the coming of the Babylonians, the day of the Lord. And we are living in the last years before Jesus comes again. We're now living in what the Bible calls the time of the end. And the next thing to planet Earth is the end of time. And in this final crucial moment of Earth's history, God in his providence said that this group of people I'm calling you to be my final witnesses when the darkness grows dark and the persecution ramps up. You're going to be the light of the world that cannot be hidden. So I want to talk today about lessons from prophet Jeremiah because he was living before the day of God's judgment and we are living before the day of God's judgment as well. So <clears throat> we start out with Jeremiah. We're going to look at his life at first and look at his message and how it applies to us. And this is the passage where we, we begin his story. It says there, in the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who in Anatoth and the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, son of Ammon of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And so uh, Jeremiah, uh, towards, the, towards the end of the kingdom of Judah, there was a good king called Hezekiah, and he had a wicked son called Manasseh, who was about as wicked as it got. And if you have your Bibles with you, I invite, invite you to open the book of Jeremiah. All the texts will be on the screen this morning. But if you prefer to see it in your Bibles, we're going through Jeremiah 1 today. And so um, uh, there was a wicked king called Manasseh um, who, who, who um, brought in idol worship to the people of, of, Egypt, of Judah. Now, idol worship is essentially the worship of demons. We know that because in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that when pagans bow down to idols, they're worshiping what? Demons. So Baal and Ashtra and Dagon and Molech are the names of ancient demons. 
And so that's why God calls it spiritual adultery. Idolatry is not bowing down to a block of wood or a block of stone or a block of gold. It's worshiping another living being. You're in a covenant relationship with God as God's people, Judah, and you're going after other living beings, other sp others they're called demons, and therefore it's called spiritual adultery. It's not called greed, that'd be lusting after gold. It is spiritual adultery because you're going after another living being. And that's why God is a divorcee. You know that? God is a divorcee. We read in the book of e Ezekiel that God, he said, I wrote a certificate of divorce for the northern ten tribes, and I sent them away because of their unfaithfulness their spiritual adultery. So if you're sitting here today and you've gone through the trauma of adultery, you need to know that God also knows what that's like. We saw in Sabbath school that God saw his son buried in the mission field. He knows what the pain of separation is. If you've gone through the trauma of a divorce, well, God is also the divine divorcee. And he knows what you've gone through. And therefore he knows how to heal you. And so... In Judah's darkest era, just before the Babylonian exile, two God-fearing boys are born. One is called Josiah, and the other was called Jeremiah. Now, Josiah comes to the throne at the age of eight, and he was a reforming king. He was noted for his, his, his pious zeal and his fervor for God, and he cleansed the land of, of idols. He destroyed the high places. He chopped down the groves where the, adult, where the orgies in the, in the, in the worship of, of the demons took place. He destroyed the, 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 where, where, the temp, where the temples were, where the bales were uh, kept, and he wiped out the prophets and the temple prostitutes from the land. That was what was going on in Judah when Josiah comes to the throne. And in the middle of his reign, they discover in the temple, they discovered the scroll of the Old Testament. Do you remember that story? Maybe some of you do. The high priest comes to Jeremiah, to Josiah, and he says, we found a copy of the scroll. And it was the book of Deuteronomy. And it's an astonishing thing, but God's people were living without the word of God. They literally didn't have it. And when they were cleaning out one of the storerooms in the temple of Jerusalem, they find a scroll of the Old Testament. Actually, the Torah. Genesis through Deuteronomy, and they read it. And in the reading of the word of God, there is a spiritual revival in the land. And if we want to have a spiritual revival in our lives, it comes through the personal reading of the word of God. So I want to encourage you, whatever else you do in life, start reading every day a passage from the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as to how that is to shape your heart and to guide your thinking and to direct the paths that you take in life. Read the word of God for yourself. Actually, we're Protestants, yes? And uh, I come from England, and all through the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, in the, in the Catholic churches, they would have a Bible in Latin known as the Vulgate, and it would be in the pulpit in the church, but during the week it would be chained shut so the common man or woman could not read the word of God. And then a guy called Tyndale translates the Bible into English, and he pays for it with his life. He's burnt at the stake, if I remember right. And uh, 20 years later, the Bible is published freely in England, and it changes England forever. You know, the Bible changes societies. This book today, and I know from my mission work, this is, this is the most banned book in human history. It's been banned by governments. It's been banished by governments. It's been buried by governments. It's been burnt by governments. This book challenges every human source of authority and evil in this world. It challenges every system of oppression, and it rebukes them, and it gives us the light of the God of love, and he shows us how he wants us to live. And governments know that this book changes human lives like nothing else. And if it sits on your shelf and you never open it and you never read it, it's not going to transform your life. So I want to challenge you today, encourage you to say, if you get nothing else from this sermon this morning, start reading the word of God for yourself. And if you're not sure where to start, start with uh, the, go the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read one story of Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as to how you are to put that into practice. And God will lead you, and in the process, he will change your life imperceptibly, day by day. But one day, like that old slaver, Newton, you can say, I'm not the man I used to be, so I'm not the man that I want to be, but by the grace of God, neither am I the man that I used to be. You can look back at life and see how God has shaped and grown your character. So you have good King Josiah, and then you have this guy, Jeremiah, born. So what do you know about Jeremiah? Well, when God called him into the prophetic ministry, he was a teenager, and he lived just a couple of miles northeast of Jerusalem in the city of Anatoth, and he was of a priestly family, just as Pastor Numa is from a priestly family, priests of animists. This young boy was in training to be a priest in Jerusalem. 
And so as a priest, as he was born in the line of, Le of the, 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 the tribe of Levi, and uh, what the priests would do is once a year for one month, each clan of the priests would be serving in the temple and they would live off the tithes. So Jeremiah was born into a family where he was guaranteed a job for life with an income for life, living off the tithes from the temple with social prestige and social status. That's what he was born into. And he would have been trained because you served as a priest from the age of 30 to 50. And once you turned 50, you retired from active service as a priest, and your job was to train the next generation. It's important that we capture the wisdom of, of our elders in our churches. It's important that those with gray hairs pass on to those with you know, black and brown hair. This is how you live life. And if the younger generation never speaks to the older generation, the younger generation is going to make some horrific mistakes in life. We need to be listening to those who've gone before, because really people make the same mistakes with every generation. And so this young boy is preached, is called by God not to be a priest. He's called out of the priestly ministry into the prophetic ministry. And he immediately goes on a preaching tour to proclaim God's message. So in chapter 11 and verse 6, we won't read it now, but Jeremiah goes on a preaching ministry around the land of Judah because God has called him to it. And young men and young women in the room today, I want to encourage you. God calls young children into the prophetic ministry. Samuel... God spoke to him as a four-year-old in the tabernacle. And then Samuel spoke to Levi, the, chief, the high priest. He gave him God's message. God spoke through David as a teenage boy, as a shepherd boy. God spoke, through, um, God spoke to um, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she was probably just a young teenage girl. And God called Jeremiah out of the priestly ministry into a life as a prophet. Now, if you were Jeremiah, what would you have chosen? A life of social status, a life of guaranteed income, a life of prestige, and a life of honor as a priest, where my whole life will be spent performing the rituals in the tabernacle, you know, cutting the throats of the lambs and so forth, and I have a guaranteed job for life. That's a, a nice way forward in life. But God calls him to prophetic ministry. And if there's one thing we know about prophets is we love prophets as long as they're not speaking to us. Isn't that right? We like prophets who are dead and buried and safely in the past. As Jesus said, you know, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, to paraphrase him, you Protestants love Martin Luther because he's dead and buried 500 years ago. But woe unto you if Martin Luther were to be alive today. We love the ministry of Sister White, but none of us would want to receive a testimony letter from her ourselves. We were kind of a bit wary about that. Well, 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 I'm not sure I believe in the spirit of prophecy if she's going to write a letter about my cherished sins. We love prophets as long as they're dead and buried and distant in the past. And God calls this young teenage boy to the prophetic ministry. Now, to be a, prof a prophet is not an easy job, as we know. In fact, his own people, they hate him for it, and they wanted to kill him. And so uh, he, uh, later on in chapter 11, he reflects on the fact, he says there, it was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew it. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. And I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy this tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. So while he was a teenager engaged in a preaching ministry, his own people were plotting to kill him. And God revealed to him that he was in danger of his very life. That's the kind of ministry that God called this teenage boy into. God works through teenagers. You know, there are, there are times in salvation history where God says things through young people that he cannot say through adults. There are times in the Protestant Reformation in, say, Sweden or Scandinavia where it was against the law to proclaim certain things, and God raised up child preachers to say them. I was warned last year, I was in England, I was warned, they said to Pastor Wine, they said, if you preach some of the sermons here that you preached in America, you'll be arrested when you come out of the pulpit for hate speech. I say, well, praise the Lord that God raises up teenagers to say, because they can't be held criminally liable. God's going to finish the work one way or the other. And if God does not have men and women of courage to stand up and say X is X and Y is Y and truth is true and people need to repent or be lost, God will raise up children to do it. He has in the past, and I'm, I am looking forward to him doing it again in our future. Now, good King Josiah died, and he was replaced by a guy called Jehoahaz, then by a weak king called Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim, there was a civil world war going on at the time. The Babylonians marched up the river Euphrates to the modern city of Mosul, that's ancient Nineveh, and they took on the Assyrians. 
and the Egyptians joined in the fight in the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. And the, 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 the Babylonians won that battle, but then they turned on the Egyptians. And so the Babylonians swept down into Egypt to invade Egypt. And on the way, King Nebuchadnezzar stopped off at Jerusalem to take the best of the land. And that was when the prophet Daniel was taken captive in 605 BC. The Babylonians invaded three times. God's people had plenty of warning that destruction was coming. Just as like the COVID pandemic has been a wake-up call to us about the fact that our governments are no longer of the people and by the people and for the people, our governments are for the elites, not for the people these days. We've been given a wake-up call in the last three years. So Nebuchadnezzar invaded and he took the temple vessels and nobility captive, including Daniel. Now, Jeremiah suffered intense persecution at the hands of King Jehoiakim. In chapter 20, he was flogged and put in a pillory. You guys know what a pillory is? It's where you stand there and you put your hands and your head through. You got a wooden board and you put your head and your hands through it and you stand there. And then people throw rotten eggs or stones at you and you're left there for a number of hours. In England, we used to put people in the pillory. And if you found a highwayman, it was a different punishment. We would, we would put a highwayman. It was like a, an iron grate that was shaped like a mummy. And you, they, would, they would lock somebody in this thing like this and hang him from a tree until the birds had eaten him. That's how, they, how we dealt with highway robbers in England in the Middle Ages. It was a pretty effective punishment. Nobody was a highwayman again after they were hung up like that. But Jeremiah, he was flocked. He was put in a pillory. He was tried for his life for alleged treason. And the nobles and the aristocrats and the elites of Jerusalem society wanted to see him executed for treason because he was preaching that the people need to give in to Babylon. And he only narrowest, narrowly escaped with his life. You know, cancel culture is nothing new. You go back through all the prophets. Cancel culture has existed since Abel was faithful and Cain was violent. Cancel culture goes all the way back almost to the Garden of Eden. It is nothing new. In every generation, there is a testing point for God's people. And God's people have to choose. Are we going to stand for truth? Or are we going to allow the social pressures to silence our voices here? Every generation has had that testing truth. That the, that, that the church had to struggle with. Right now, it's the sexual revolution is testing the church. When you go back to the 1930s, it was evolution. In the 1910s, 1920s, it was fundamentalism. And as you go back through human, uh, church history, there is always a testing truth, and there is cancel culture. Now, when Jehoiakim died, the king, he was replaced by a guy called Jehoiakim, and he surrounded Jerusalem to the Babylonians for the second time. And, uh, to, and at that time, a young man called Ezekiel was taken captive and sent off to Babylon. So Daniel was taken captive with Nebuchadnezzar. Then 20 years later, Ezekiel is taken captive, and he's a priest, and he gets taken off to the land of Babylonia. And so uh, then you have Jeremiah left in Jerusalem. And the last king of Israel is a guy called Zedekiah. He was a weak man. He was a puppet ruler for the Babylonians. And because Nebuchadnezzar had taken all the educated people from the land, he struggled to rule the people who were left. And so Jeremiah, in chapter 24, he compares the remnants of Judah. He says they're like bad figs unfit for food. So the people left in the land that were, were not the educated, they were not the wise, they were not the skilled. It was the dregs of society was left to, to farm the land. And this is where Jeremiah is ministering. Now, Jeremiah, his message was unpopular. He called the people to return to God. He called the people to accept Babylonian rule. Can you imagine it? God, God is working through Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to take the city, Jerusalem. And just because your prophets say, peace, peace, and the temple is here, does not mean that God is going to protect you, because you've turned your backs on him, and you're committing spiritual adultery, and going after the gods of this world. But he prophesied that after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, God would restore his people to Jerusalem. There was the promise of redemption after 70 years. This was a very unpopular message. He was labeled a traitor. He was imprisoned in a private dungeon. He was put in a guardhouse. And finally, he was thrown into the public sewers and left to die. I mean, he knew what persecution looked like. He was fed on bread and water during the siege. And it was only an Ethiopian servant of the king. His name was Ebed Melech, which means son of the king or servant of the king. This Ethiopian, this uh, faithful Ethiopian man went to the king and said, you can't leave Jeremiah down in the sewer. He's going to die. And so the Ebed Melech, the servant of the king, that's what his name means. Um, he lifted Jeremiah out and he made sure he was taken care of. The Babylonians finally arrived to finish off the troublesome kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah lived through the siege. 
He saw the horrors of starvation when mothers would eat their newborn children and eat the afterbirth. He endured starvation with the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem fell for the final, the third time, Jeremiah was captured by the Babylonians. And what did they do to him? Because they killed the king's sons in front of his eyes. Then they put out his eyes. They slaughtered the leaders of the land to the Babylonians. But when they came to Jeremiah, we noticed something very, very interesting. They didn't kill him because what had been happening was when Jeremiah was speaking to the people of Jerusalem, his messages were being heard in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar realized that there was a prophet in Jerusalem called Jeremiah. And he was warning the people to surrender to the Babylonians and to turn away from their sins and accept a Babylonian captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar, who'd already encountered Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he recognized the voice of God in Jeremiah. So when Israel, Jerusalem was destroyed for the final time, this is what the captain of the guards said to Jeremiah. He says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guards, that's the Babylonian general, had let him go from Ramah when he took him bound in fetters along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah, Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guards took Jeremiah, so this is the Babylonian general, and he says to him, quote, the Lord your God threatened this place with this disaster. And now the Lord has brought it about and has done as he said, because all of you sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice. Therefore, this thing has come upon you. Now, look, I've just released you today from the fetters on your hands, the chains. If you wish to come with me to Babylon, come and I'll take good care of you. But if you do not wish to come with me to Babylon, you need not come. See, the whole land is before you. Go wherever you think it good and right to go. This is an astonishing offer, yes? So the Babylonian king makes sure that the Babylonian general, who's wiped out Jerusalem and that multiple people have been slaughtered, the nobles, the king, his sons are all dead, but one person has like a get out of jail free card, and that's Jeremiah. And the Babylonians recognize the voice of God, even when the people of Judah reject the voice of God. And the Babylonians listened to what Jeremiah was saying, and they realized that God was speaking through him, and they recognized that God's prophecies through Jeremiah had come true, and therefore they were not inclined to kill Jeremiah, but they said, we know that God speaks through Jeremiah. Now we're offering you a, a, a fully paid pension in Babylon. You can come with us to Babylon. You can connect with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. You maybe want to meet up with Ezekiel because these are guys all from the priestly class where, where Jeremiah is from. You can meet with your long lost friends. You know that Daniel is praying over your writings. Daniel chapter nine. Daniel thinks you're a prophet. You can meet up with your friends in Babylon. We'll give you a house. We'll give you a pension. Everything will be fine. You can go into gentle retirement. Or this devastated land where just the dregs of society are left, you can go anywhere you want here. And by the way, we're destroying anything and everything of value. It's quite a choice, yes? Who would have blamed Jeremiah for taking an honorable retirement and going to Babylon? But he didn't. Why? Because God had called him to minister to the people of Judah. And when God lays a burden on your heart for a people group or a district of San Antonio or a part of the world such as Southern Chad, until God releases you from that call, it's our responsibility to fulfill that call. God may have called you to be a Sabbath school teacher or a pianist here or an elder in the church. And until God releases you from that call, he's asking you to be faithful to that call. If God has placed you in a position of leadership somewhere, until he releases you, you be faithful in that position of leadership. The ministry will not, does not begin with you and it does not end with you. But while you're here and God has laid that call upon your heart and opened the door for you to serve, it is our privilege to be faithful to the call that God has called us and equipped us for. And Jeremiah, he's faithful to the call. The interesting thing about this story is we realize that, that Jeremiah was preaching in Jerusalem and 600 miles away, there was a pagan king listening to every word he said and believing him. So we may preach in San Antonio, but you may have people watching online in Florida or Alaska or Germany who are receiving the gospel and the gift of eternal life. The point is you have no idea of the ripple effect of your ministry. A word of encouragement in one person's life 
can have a ripple effect through the rest of their life that you have no idea is will ever happen. Because words take root in people's hearts. If your father says to you, you're a worthless so-and-so, no matter what else happens in life, that word sticks with you. And it hurts. You'll never amount to anything. The chances are you probably won't amount to anything unless God works a miracle in your heart. Words have consequences. Words have impact. When you speak a word, you cannot undo it. So we have to be careful with our speech. But we're also called to recognize that when we do speak, it can, have a, it can reach the entire world unbeknownst to us. So whether you speak in words or whether you speak in deeds, let God be known in all that you say and do. Because you don't know the impact of what you're saying. You don't know who's listening to you. I don't have my phone, up with me, don't have my phone with me right now, but I would certainly say um, Amazon is probably listening to this sermon right now. Um, quite possibly the NSA are recording a bunch of uh, phones in this room right now. Um, possibly the FBI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we know that these things are listening to us. Yes. How do you know that somebody in the NSA is not listening to your phone discussion, realizing that's a born again Christian? I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. You don't know where your words are going, and you don't know the ripple effect of how you are living your life. Jeremiah didn't expect the king of Babylon and this Babylonian general to be listening to him, but he was, and it came back to be a blessing to him in life. So choose your words carefully. Let your words be as seeds of life in people's lives. Let your words be seasoned with truth and grace. And God will take them where they need to go. And he will create a harvest from them that you cannot begin to imagine today. So Jeremiah ministered to his people. Now he chose to stay with the people of Judah. But even now he had no rest. Because when the Babylonians went back to, Jer to Babylon... Um, J J Jeremiah was left in Jerusalem with the riffraff, those who were left, and the king of Babylon appointed a governor called Gedaliah um, to rule this province, and the people rebelled, and they killed the governor, and then they said to Baruch, and to, that's the secretary of Jeremiah, and to Jeremiah himself, they said, we're going to flee from Jerusalem down into Egypt, into exile, because we don't want the king of Babylon to come after us and punish us for killing the governor. And they said to Jeremiah, we'd like to take you to, back to Egypt with us. And Jeremiah says, well, I'm not sure that's such a great idea. And they said, well, we know you're a prophet. We know God speaks through you. So could you ask God whether he wants us to go down to Egypt or not? And Jeremiah says, will you just wait a few days? I'm going to pray. And when the word of the Lord comes to me, he'll give you an answer. So they wait and they pray and they fast. And a few days later, Jeremiah gets a word from God that says, the people are not to flee down into Egypt. They're to stay right where they were uh, in Judah and Jerusalem. And the people of Judah, they say to Jeremiah, well, we asked you what God thinks, and now God has told you what he thinks, and now we know what God thinks, but we're still going to go down to Egypt. And by the way, we're going to take you with us whether you like it or not, because you represent the presence of God in our community. It's like you're like a talisman. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant. That's been buried and lost but by the time the, Babylon the Babylonians have taken Jerusalem. But this prophet, this guy we've ignored for 40 plus years, and we just asked him, should we go down to Egypt? And God said, no, but we're going to go anyway. We're going to forcibly take him with us because we want his presence in our midst. And we laugh at this, yes? But too many Christians today have the presence of God in their homes and live in willful disobedience to God's will. That's true. We have these things gathering shelves in our, in our homes, gathering dust on the shelves while we engage in willful and cherished and indulgent sin. We're not much different today. If God has given us this incredible gift, a book that has turned the world upside down so many times, it is not only our privilege, but it's our responsibility to live in harmony with God's revealed will. I can say as a pastor that too many people know what God's will for them is. They just don't want to follow it. So what they say is, I'm struggling with this certain issue. I, I, in my heart of hearts, I know God doesn't want me to do this. So I'm just going to read the Bible through one more time because I'm hoping for a get-out clause for my particular situation. And so I read the Bible through one more time because I know there's a get-out clause that allows me to do it in my circumstances. And of course, we never find those get-out clause verses. So we remain in willful indulgence and cherished sin. And we're lost. It was one sin took Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. It was one sin kept Moses out of the promised land. 
Sin is deadly. It's not to be played with. There's no such thing as, as a house pet sin or as a tame sin or a private cherished sin that nobody knows about. Everything we do in life is known before the heavenly watchers. Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5. The Holy Spirit knows everything that passes our minds. Nothing is hidden before God. He doesn't just judge us based on our actions. He judges us based on our thoughts and the motivations of our hearts. So if you are sitting here today and you've come from a life where there is a cherished sin going on in your life right now, then hear the word of the Lord. Repent and live. Receive the gift of eternal life. Receive God's gift of forgiveness by faith and ask God to give you the grace and the strength and the power to overcome that cherished sin. God will give you the victory and he will give you the promise of eternal life. But do not sit here and harden your heart and say, oh, this thing doesn't really matter. It does matter. It absolutely does matter. You know, um, if, I, if you have a spouse and you have a strong marriage and somebody says to you, oh, I saw your spouse the other day. She, uh, she was going into a hotel with a guy. Who was that? I'll tell you this. 1% one per, uh, one of 1% of doubt will destroy 100% good marriage. Is that right? The slightest element of doubt will erode a perfectly good marriage. A tiny little stone that you can barely see in, the, in your shoe destroys your walk to school to work. You know about it. You can't wait to finish that journey. So take seriously what I'm saying here this morning, please. I haven't just come, I haven't come down here to entertain. I've become because each of your lives is precious to God. And he created you and purposed you for an eternal life and an eternal inheritance to share in the riches of Christ, to share in the rulership of this universe. When we get to heaven, according to Daniel 7, verses 24 and 25, we're not going to be sitting on clouds strumming harps. It says there that the, the, the saints of the Most High will share in the dominion of the everlasting kingdom. That is, we're going to be entrusted by God with the rulership of the entire known universe. And why would God entrust to you and to me the rulership of the universe? It's because we are the only fallen world that exists. We know the pain of sin and we know the joy of forgiveness. Other people may know that God is a God of love theoretically in the universe, but we know experientially that God is a God of love. And therefore, we are the ones best placed to represent him before the rest of the unfallen universe. We've tasted the dregs and the pain of sin. We've tasted the joy and the grace of forgiveness. I know that he is a good God. So, how was Jeremiah as a person during these 40 years? Well, he ministered for 40 plus years to an ungrateful nation. He spoke out at enormous personal cost. He was persecuted, he was imprisoned, he was flogged, he was condemned as a traitor, he was starved, he was forced to eat bread and water, he was forced to migrate to Egypt as an old man, away from his family and his home. He lived with the constant threat of execution, assassination, or judicial murder, and he, lo and he lived to see the fulfillment of his promises of Babylonian captivity. So all his promises came true. And how was he as an individual? Well, we find out in the book of Jeremiah that he was a timid individual who longed to withdraw from public life and weep over the state of God's people. Do you not sometimes want to weep over what is happening in this nation? Do you not sometimes want to weep about what happens sometimes in the body of Christ? Do you not sometimes want to weep what happens about in your own family and in your own life? Well, Jeremiah, he says, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. He's weeping for the ones who've been slaughtered by the Babylonians. I preached, I told them, if you do not turn away from this sin, God is going to bring judgment in the form of the Babylonians, and they wouldn't listen, and now they're dead. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I should have preached just one more sermon. Maybe my appeals should have been just a bit more appealing or convicting to them. And what could I have done so they were not dead today, so they would not be dead today? Can you imagine, Jeremiah, knowing the slaughter is out there, and I failed to avert it? The sense of failure... What could I have done better so the people would listen to me? I was at it for 40 years and nobody listened except the Babylonians. I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. He goes on to say, I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. That is, he did not preach peace, peace while the nation fell apart. He did not close his eyes to the evil that was all around him. He didn't eat and drink and be, to marry, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die. No. 
It says, under the weight of your hand, I sat alone for you had filled me with indignation. He was a man who was grieving before Israel and before the Babylonians came. He was grieving what was about to come. You, as a, from a pastoral perspective, you say this is anticipatory grief. If you have a loved one who's diagnosed with a degenerative disease, okay, name your degenerative disease. Let's say they have cancer. You have a spouse that has terminal cancer. You don't start grieving when they die. You start grieving the moment you get the cancer diagnosis. There's hope mixed with grief. And finally, that's called anticipatory grief. You're anticipating their death. And finally, they die. And you find when they die, you've got no more tears left to shed. And you wonder, what's wrong with me? It's because I've used up my quota of tears in the anticipatory grief. And Jeremiah experiences this anticipatory grief. He says, I've become the laughing stock of all my people, the object of their taunt songs all day long. That is, I preach and I teach, and they're mocking me in their, in their um, public songs and ditties. They're not listening to me. They're mocking me. They're sneering at me. I've become an object of fun around the campfire. The, the little children sing songs about that crazy guy, Jeremiah, and the Babylonians who are coming, and isn't this guy crazy? Nobody appreciates him for 40 plus years of ministry. So this then is Jeremiah. He's a lonely man, but he's a faithful man. He's a shy man. He's an introverted man. He's timid, and he's a deeply sorrowful man who longs to retire from public life. And what I like about Jeremiah is that we think you've got to be an extrovert to be a preacher. No, I'm actually an introvert. No, I can tell you I'm an introvert. Like an extrovert is energized by being with people, yes? An introvert is, is energized by being alone, right? So when I get home from preaching weekend, I just want to sit in my room for 24 hours and look at a white wall and do nothing, like a stun ox. Because it's really draining for an introvert to stand in front of people, all right? Those of you introverts, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are not introverts, count your blessings. But if you are an introvert, the point about this is, just because you're an introvert doesn't mean God can't won't call you to a public ministry. It means that you're going to suffer with those that, that God is calling you to minister to. You're going to better empathize and sympathize with them because you're going through a difficult process to be a minister to that people. So you may be sitting here today and say, oh, I'm an introvert. My personality is not suited to some kind of ministry. And my response is, if God calls you to something, he's going to carry you through it. Regardless whether you're introvert or extrovert, regardless whether you're sanguine or choleric or melancholic or whatever personality description you may want to give yourself, if God calls you to a ministry like Jeremiah, he's going to give you the gifts and the strength and the equipping to get through that ministry. He's not asking for perfect people to step into ministry. He's asking for willing people to step into ministry. He's asking for boys and girls to say, here, my Lord, send me. I don't know where the road is going to go. I don't know what the end is going to be, but I'm willing to go with you, Lord. So let's look at his call then, shall we? What was it that gave him his driving force through his years as a prophet? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, he presents his credentials. And the first thing he says is this. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do we hear from this? That Jeremiah is not preaching that which is politically correct. Because the word of the Lord came to me. And if the word of the Lord comes to this prophet, it's probably because there's a problem with God's people, Judah. So Jeremiah is not reading the opinion polls before he preaches. He's not asking what is politically correct before he preaches. He's not asking what's the latest permutation of critical gender theory before I preach. He's saying the word of the Lord came to me. I've got a message from God and I'm going to be faithful in giving it to you as a people. And because it comes from God, I'm not going to question it. And whether you accept it or reject it, the consequences be on your heads. But God has asked me to give you a message, and I'm going to faithfully pass it on to you. And the consequences are in God's hands, whether it affects me, whether it affects you. I am not a prophet for hire. I do not follow the latest dreams of fashionable thought. My vocation as a prophet is not by human choice, but it's a direct commission from God. And therefore, you need to listen to what I'm saying. This is what Jeremiah is saying here. You know, Brother Numa was raised as an animist. He was going to be a priest. He was going to inherit the high priesthood from his father. But God called him into a different kind of ministry, a ministry without social applause, a ministry without wealth, a ministry without um, status in society, a ministry that calls people out of the worship of spirits to the worship of the true God. That means God called Pastor Numa as he called every minister and pastor, and he called Jeremiah into spiritual warfare. 
but I'm going to bring you into a fight. I'm not going to lead you by still waters and green pastures just yet. If I'm calling you into ministry, I'm calling you to get in the fight because there is a struggle going on for humanity's salvation. Now, this sense of God's calling stuck with Jeremiah through his entire life. In chapter 20, he reflects on this and he says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up within my bones. I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. So you might say that Jeremiah was a man on fire, that a God had given him a message. He knew it was unpopular, but he was going to give it no matter what happened because it was like a fire burning within him. God had given him a commission. He'd given him a task and he was going to be faithful in discharging it no matter what people may say about him. I'm going to be faithful in the message that God has given me. And people can accept it or reject it. That's between them and God. But between me and God, there is a responsibility to discharge the calling he's placed in my life. And if God has called you into a ministry, he's asking you today, today to be faithful in discharging the ministry he's called you to. You may be a preacher in this pulpit from Sabbath to Sabbath. You may be a Sabbath school teacher from Sabbath to Sabbath. You may be a deacon or a deaconess. You may be involved in personal ministry. You may have a, a, a prayer ministry. You may have a helpline for prayers. You may have a Dorcas ministry. Whatever it may be, God is asking you to be faithful to the ministry that he's called you for and equipped you for today. Because he, he's calling you because he's placed you and hand-shaped you for this moment in time. And he intends to reach other people through you. He's not calling us into ministry that we might be glorified. He's calling us into ministry that he might be glorified in the lives of the lost. Amen. That people, you know, in America, we have an epidemic of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, sports addictions, porn addictions, the fentanyl crisis, opioid addictions. This says we are a nation enduring significant pain. We're medicating on all kinds of drugs. And it's, some are socially acceptable, like sports addictions. You know, guys who watch nine hours of NFL every Sunday. Okay. And some people medicate on stuff that is not socially acceptable, like opioids and fentanyl. And there's a good chance in this congregation here there are people who medicate on porn. And we turn to our drugs of choice when we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. The acronym HALT is a good shorthand for what normally drives us to these, these drugs of choice. Our nation is hurting. There's pain in every home. There's pain everywhere. And God has sent us to be his ambassadors, ambassadors of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but ambassadors of the King of Healers as well. And he's, called, he's asking us here in San Antonio to be his hands and his feet and to discharge faithfully the callings placed on us that other people might turn away from the one who brings life and death and destruction and turn to the one who brings life that, that we may have it abundantly. And that's what he's calling us to, that we are ambassadors of hope as the prophet Zechariah says, that people might be prisoners of hope. I love that phrase. To be a prisoner of hope, what a wonderful thing, yes? I cannot escape from the blessed hope that is within my heart. I'm a prisoner of hope. So Jeremiah has his burning fire in his bones. He cannot be silent. He cannot hold in or deny God's calling his life, nor can he deny God's message. He's been called by God. He's been commissioned by God. He's now a man on fire from God. And he goes on to say, in his, and as he describes his call, he says, God spoke to Jeremiah and says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's an amazing passage, yes? That before this boy was born, God had formed, and the phrase is, I handmade you. In your mother's womb, I handmade you for a heavenly purpose. And you, didn't, you weren't even aware of it just yet but you are God's handiwork. You're not a Ford Model T where you can have any color you want as long as it's black, as Henry Ford once said. Everybody is handmade by God in their mother's wombs. And God knows when he makes every, every child in his mother or her mother's womb, God knows the purpose he has for that child for humanity's blessing, ultimately humanity's salvation. In the womb. We know that when um, Mary came to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, who was pregnant with John the Baptist, John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb when Mary ex expressed the good news that the Messiah was coming, yes? Which means that even in the mother's womb, the preborn child is open to the uh, influence of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a bunch of cells. That's a living being in there, created in God's image, being formed in God's image, open and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We now say that 
that a child can be affected by uh, in utero influences. You can be born with what? Fetal alcohol syndrome. If the mother's a drug addict or an alcohol addict, it passes on to the child. If you play certain music to your children, it can affect them as, uh, later in life when they're in the womb. We are handmade by our Heavenly Father for a heavenly purpose. Cherish every pregnant lady, every ch- pre- pregnant mother. And by the way, it's only women can get pregnant just in case people are wondering about that this morning. Cherish every pregnant mother because she carries inside her God's handiwork. I formed you in the womb, says God to Jeremiah. Likewise to each one of us today, young or old, God has given each one of us a place of duty and responsibility in his plan for humanity's salvation. And our purpose in life is to find and be obedient to God's purpose in our lives. Young people often say, what is God's plan for my life? That's a very self-centered way of looking at it. A better question to ask is, what part does God have for me to play in his plan for humanity's salvation? How can I contribute to the salvation of my neighbor? How can I contribute to the salvation of those who hate me? How can I contribute to the salvation of those who've hurt me? How can I contribute to the salvation of those who despise me because of who I am and where I come from? That's a better question to ask. How can we fit into the wider plan of humanity's salvation? We tend to look at the world through a little microscope. That's just my life down here in San Antonio. And God is looking at human history for 6,000 years. He's painted this incredible canvas of the human history and the human experience. And he's asking us today to partake in that wider plan. The story didn't begin with us and it won't end with us. But his purposes will be fulfilled for humanity's salvation. Jeremiah is a classic example. In Jeremiah chapter, uh, 1 Kings 18, sorry, is uh, Elijah. Elijah runs from from Jezebel. He runs from Ahab. He runs down to Mount Sinai. And when he gets to Mount Sinai, he complains twice. He says, oh, Lord, he said, I've done my best. And the people didn't respond. He said, and I, only I am left. Remember that? And he suffers burnout and depression. And God looks down at this exhausted gospel worker And the first thing he does is he allows him time to rest. Notice in the story, like physical rest is good. It's not a bad thing. Taking a walk by the beach is not a bad thing. If you're a gospel worker, don't feel guilty when you're tired. Just take a walk by the beach. He allows uh, uh, Elijah to sleep. Then the next thing the angel does is makes him some food. Like you need physical, you need physical recovery here. You're burnt out. You need a time out so you can physically recover. And then God asks Elijah some simple questions. There's a psychological component and there's a spiritual component. And in our lives, when we feel burnt out in ministry, God wants us to have that time of physical healing, but also spiritual healing and also emotional and psychological healing. It's all wrapped up in that story of Elijah. And when Elijah is down there in Mount Sinai and thinks, only I, only I am left, God says, well, get up, Elijah. I've got a job for you. And what's that, says Elijah? Well, says God, you think you're the last prophet? I want you to go back into uh, Israel and find a man called Elisha and anoint him to be the next prophet. You mean... You've got another prophet? Yes, Elijah, my work did not begin with you. It won't end with you. So don't think you're the bee's knees. Do you have have the expression in America? (laughs) You're not the center of attention. You're not the center of the universe. Your ministry did not begin with you. It does not end with you. When you are dead, I'll be continuing my work for my people with a prophet called Elisha. And you've had problems with a guy called Ahab? Well, fine. He's not the end of the story either. Because I want you to go back and anoint a man called Jehu, and he's going to take care of of Elijah, of um, Ahab for us. So Ahab will be taken care of. Jezebel will be taken care of. Your succession is taken care of with a guy called Elisha. And I want you to go to Syria and anoint a new guy there to be the king of Syria to wipe out the current king who's attacking Israel. So Elijah, before you die, before you, you, you retire from public ministry, I want you to know that all the next chapters are all figured out in my head. And so in this passage here, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. This gives Jeremiah a new sense of gravity, away from himself and back to God, away from his plans for himself and his his little career here on planet Earth, and back to God's master plan. Jeremiah's life is being painted on a broader canvas, giving it much broader meaning and significance, and that's what he wants for us today. Your life and your ministry is to be lived on a broader canvas. God's work for the people of San Antonio did not begin with you and it will not end with you but he does need you to work for him today. And he will do his work for the people of of San Antonio until Jesus comes again. To be told before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, reminds us that even if you have a sensitive, shy, and introverted nature like Jeremiah, 
he is still handmade by God for a heavenly commission. You may think my personality isn't, you know, some people are just charismatic, yes? Like, I won't mention any names, but there are people in the Adventist world, they walk into the room with just like stardust everywhere. Like, there's just magnetism to them. I think in the political arena, maybe some like when Barack Obama first came on the scene, there was just like stardust everywhere he went. People recognize charisma. JF, JFK is another example. Just charisma. Some people have it and most people don't. And Jeremiah's thinking, Lord, why can't you choose somebody with charisma to be the prophet? No. You have a sensitive nature. You have a shy nature. You like to sit in the corner and weep. You're an introvert. I handmade you for this task, Jeremiah. You're kidding me. Yes, I handmade you for this task. Jeremiah, you're not a mass-produced being. You're handmade for God for a God-given task. He was no casual choice for the prophetic ministry. And we were handmade by God for a calling in life. And whatever our strengths and weaknesses are in our character, God knows about those things. But he still calls us into ministry one way or the other. And he's going to carry us through whatever challenges we may face. God says to Jeremiah, I consecrated you. As before his birth, God had set Jeremiah apart for his prophetic calling. He was calling Jeremiah to a life of holiness, to live and think and be after the ways of God rather than after the ways of man. You know, and just the modern application of this today, you turn your Bibles to Leviticus. And in Leviticus, we have this, this call by God to holiness. I find it right in my Bible here. And in Leviticus, chapter 18, it's in verse 3. This is God speaking to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel. He says, you shall not do, verse 3, this is Leviticus 18, you shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not observe their statutes. My ordinances you shall observe, and my statutes you shall keep following them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes, my ordinances. By doing so, you shall live. Then he goes on to describe a whole series of, of sexual behaviors where to avoid like incest and bestiality and homosexuality. And then he goes on. He concludes that section in chapter 20 and verse 26, where God says to Moses and to the people of Israel, he says, you shall be holy to me or consecrated to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have separated you from other peoples to be mine. And so the call to holiness is placed upon all of God's children. When the Council of Jerusalem said you would avoid sexual immorality and avoid food offered to idols and food with blood in it and food that's been strangled, that was shorthand for this passage of the, of the Levitical law. So we are called to holiness. We are called to purity in what we eat and what we do with our bodies and also what we put into our bodies. We are called to holiness. We're not called to live according to the laws of the nations around us. We are called to live according to what God says is holy and true and pure. So whatever the government mandates, you have to make a choice. Is this consistent with the word of God? Is this consistent with the call to holiness? Or is this something that is coming from a fallen world and is part of a lying narrative? We all need to make choices. And we're responsible to God for those choices. We are consecrated before birth for a calling in life. Every one of us. God has a purpose. He set us apart for something in the plan of salvation. God was calling holiness, Jeremiah, to live and be and think after the ways of God rather than the ways of man. Jeremiah was being called to a life of personal devotion to God, to a rejection of personal sin and to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I've given you a message, it says, to the nations. Now, it doesn't just say I'm giving you a prophet. You know, I'm going to make you a prophet to the people of Judah. But he says, I'll make you a prophet to the Goyim, the nations of the world. That's why we read Jeremiah today. And that's why today when you preach or do a Sabbath school class or do an evangelistic series on the internet, it goes to the whole world. It goes to the whole world. And what was, Jeremiah's, what was the essence of Jeremiah's message? So listen carefully, church. It's this, that God's people would go through a terrible time of trouble, but God would eventually deliver them. That's the essence of his message. That there will be a time of Babylonian oppression and Babylonian um, uh, uh, captivity, but God will be with his people and he'll deliver them if they're faithful to him. That's the essence of his message. Then if you just drill down a little bit deeper, you might say that if God's people wish to live through that time of trouble, that will come before the day of the Lord, that is the coming of Jesus, and experience God's deliverance, then God's people are called to turn away from their sins and to turn to God with faith and obedience. 
Resist the devil and he will what? And the next verse says, and draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So in turning away from Satan, I'm turning towards God. There's no neutral grounds in the great controversy. People today, they want to play with the occult. They want to play with sin. They get involved with the occult. The demons harass them. And they, they think that the God's kingdom is over here and Satan's kingdom is over here. And there's a neutral no man's land in the middle. And I just want to get back to a secular life focused on the pursuit of entertainment and pleasure. But the truth of the matter is there is no neutral no man's land in the middle. There's the kingdom of Satan and there's a border and there's a kingdom of God. And if you're not actively, intentionally, knowingly in the kingdom of God, by default, you're in Satan's kingdom. And you can't just say, Jesus, I want you to set me free from Satan's attacks so I can go back to a secular way of living again, because you're still in Satan's kingdom, whether you admit it or not. That is why if I ask Jesus to be savior of my life, I'm also asking him to be Lord of my life because I'm entering his kingdom. That's why he is my savior and my Lord. If he is just my savior from the attacks of Satan today, then the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 13 is that if a man has a demon and a demon is cast out of him and the demon goes off and wanders and went in wasteland places and he comes back and he finds the house empty and swept clean, that is, the Holy Spirit has not filled that person's life, then that demon goes and finds seven other demons more wicked than itself. They come and inhabit that person and that person's latter condition is worse than the former condition. You find that in, in, in Matthew and Luke, uh, Mark there. And so... And the point about that is, if, if Satan is driven out of your life and you have an empty life that is a secular life filled with like the pursuit of fine restaurants and NFL games and all the rest of it, before you realize it, Satan will come back worse than ever. So if you want Jesus to set you free from Satan's attacks, you're asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit from that moment on. You're asking to live what the Apostle calls the life of the Spirit. A life of worship, a life of witness, a life of study. A life where you're asking God to take away the works of the flesh and to fill your character with the fruit of the Spirit. It's a life where you're asking God to rebuke Satan's attacks on you in order that you might be set free to bless other people. Not that you may be set free to pursue your own financial goals. I appoint you a prophet to the nation, says God to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, if you drill down a little bit deeper than this, I won't show the text here, but Jeremiah was calling people away from a superficial religion, a one-day-a-week religion, to a true daily walk with God. Jeremiah 17, he taught that spiritual evil has as its heart, its source, the problem of the human heart. That the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. In Jeremiah chapter 13, he taught that unless we receive a new heart from God, we will forever remain wicked. We may know how to behave as good moral people on the outside, but unless God changes our hearts, we will forever be rotten on the inside. Jeremiah chapter 24, we're told that what is needed is a new heart experience, bringing with a new love for God, new faith in God, new obedience to God. And in Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, Jeremiah points forward to the miracle of conversion, where the God works in the hearts and lives of all who follow Jesus Christ in the new covenant experience. So I don't know where you are today in your walk with God, but Jeremiah told of a time where God would make a new covenant with his people, where your sins and the failures of the past will be washed away. And we enter into that through being born again of water and the spirit. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, we are upholding this new covenant. Jesus says, this is the new covenant of my blood. When he lifts up the cup, this is the new covenant. And I'm going to write my law on your hearts so you instinctively do what is pleasing to God. And I'm going to take away your heart of stone that is calloused and indifferent to the suffering of your fellow humanity. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh where you are sensitive to the struggles of others and you want to be a blessing to them and lift them out of their problems. This is part of the new covenant experience. This is the message of Jeremiah. He's calling us to have a new heart today, a new heart, so that people see God in us. We don't just profess to be Christians. People see it in every move we make and every breath we take. We are Christians. It, 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 it oozes out of us. You know, when somebody falls in love, when a teenager falls in love, can't you tell? Like for, big, falling in love is like having a bad case of body odor. You can't hide it. Maybe that's not a good comparison. If you have a strong case of body odor, you can't hide that, yes? Like you can sit in church, you can put on like 10 overcoats and people still know you've got body odor. And being in love... People know when you're in love. People know when you, you know when you fall in love. You may try to deny it, but you know when you've fallen in love. 
And other people can see it. They see it in the look in your eyes. They see it in where you're looking. They see it in the twinkle. They see it in the, 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 the extra bounce in your steps. They know when you're in love. And people know when you're in a new covenant experience with God. When you love your heavenly father and he loves you and you've received forgiveness for your past and because you've experienced grace, grace can flow through you to those around you. And this world says somebody hurt you, you hurt them back. You say, yes, that person's hurt me, but they are also a person that's hurting themselves. So I'm choosing to forgive rather than to wreak vengeance upon them today. And when I choose forgiveness over violence, I'm going to break the cycle of violence that we have in society today. Only thus can the cycle of violence be, break, can be broken, not because I've killed all my enemies, but because we've forgiven each other and be reconciled. This is the Christian thing to do. Jeremiah shrank from his call. Now, <clears throat> um, Brother Ricardo says you can preach as long as you want, and it's quarter past one. And so I don't know how long, you know, some congregations are immunized against long sermons, and they can sit through hours and hours and hours. I don't know about this congregation here. So I know it's getting past, you know, some people got low blood sugar, so I'm going to try and bring this to a close soon. But we could talk for hours about this, but we won't. So hang in there, okay? Uh, we're coming, we're going to come to the close. Uh, when, when God called Moses, six times Moses says, but, in Exodus 2 and 3, but they won't listen to me, but I'm not a good speaker, but I don't know what to say, but how do I know they're going to believe me, but what sign shall I give them? I mean, Moses has every objection to be called into ministry. And Jeremiah has the same kind of objection. He says, our Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a teenager. I'm a shy and a timid boy. I'm scared of public speaking and dreading public criticism. Don't, God, you have somebody better to work with? Possibly somebody with better connections, higher education, deeper insights, and more maturity. Surely you only pray, playing around when you handcrafted me. Wouldn't it be better for you as the potter to find another lump of clay from Jeremiah 17 and find somebody else who will carry the gospel message to the people of Judah? If you're the potter and everybody is the clay, find somebody else. Shape somebody else to be a faith, faithful gospel messenger. And God's reply to Jeremiah has something for all of us because it's typical of his approach to human weaknesses. What Jeremiah said about himself and his weaknesses was true. God did not deny it, but it's not the point. When God commands, there remains only one duty, and that is obedience. It says, but the Lord said to me, do not say, Jeremiah, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. That is, I know you're a boy, but I'm still calling you. You may think you're shy and timid and insecure and an introvert, but I'm still calling you Jeremiah. You're going to speak whatever I give you, and you're going to go to wherever I send you. The proper question is not, who am I to do this, or why can't you find somebody else? But what are my instructions? Where am I, where am I posted? Where's God going to send me? Jeremiah must go before idolatrous kings, corrupt priests, lying prophets, and unjust judges. And not a lot has changed from then to today, has it? Our political and economic and legal elites, idolatrous kings, corrupt priests, lying prophets, and unjust judges. Society hasn't changed very much. Jeremiah had claimed he could not speak, but God promises to give him words from on high. Jeremiah is scared, and God promises to be with him. This promise is repeated three times. Do not be afraid of them, says God, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Next promise. But you gird up your loins, stand up and tell them everything I command you. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. Why? For I am with you, saith the Lord, to deliver you. Then the third promise. And I'll make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For what? I am with you to save you and deliver you, saith the Lord. Three times God says to Jeremiah, you're going to be in the fight, but I'm going to be with you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo went into the fiery furnace, and I was with them. Daniel went into the lion's den, and I was with them. You may think you're not suited to this ministry, but God says to Jeremiah, three times, I'm going to be with you in the fight. God doesn't promise to take us out of the fight. He promises to be with us in the fight. And the battle belongs to God, but he needs a human agent to be a representative here on earth in the fights that are going on on planet earth, in our societies and our communities. Jeremiah is scared, but God promises to be with him. Yes, Jeremiah has inner struggles. He has his inner doubts, but he will not allow those inner struggles to prevent him from obeying God's call. So God touches Jeremiah's lips there on the screen. And the Lord said to me, now I've put my words in your mouth. And the touch of God places beyond doubt the givenness of the message and the mandate of the messenger. It would not spare Jeremiah the heartache that will go later, but it put his commission beyond doubt. Then to make sure Jeremiah gets the point, God gives him two signs. 
And then we're coming to the closer. It says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. Now in Jerusalem, um, where they, get, they sometimes get snow in winter, the almond tree is the first tree to bring forth buds in the spring. Of all the trees in Jerusalem, the almond tree is the first to sense, okay, spring's coming. Where I grew up in England, when the bluebells appeared in the forests and the crocuses and the daffodils, you knew that spring was coming. Before the trees gave out their buds, it was the bluebells and the daffodils. I'm not sure what it is here in San Antonio, but you've probably got plants down here that tell you that spring is coming. And in Jerusalem, it's the almond tree. And the word for almond means wakeful. And the message is this. When all seems dormant, when evil seems triumphant, when God's people seem spiritually dead, when there appears to be no hope, God is wakeful, ready for his moment to fulfill his word. God promises he will deliver his, his people from their time of Babylonian trouble. The next promise is this. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot tilted away from the north. And so geographically, the oppression of God's people from Babylonians came from the north down the Mediterranean coast to Jerusalem. There would come a time of trouble upon God's people in the form of Babylonian attack, oppression, and captivity. Jeremiah and the inhabitants of Israel would learn the hard way that being a follower of God does not give you spiritual or diplomatic immunity to the troubles of life. But the message of God was that God's people would live through that time of Babylonian supremacy and oppression. But during this time of trouble, they had the assurance that God would rise to deliver his faithful people in his time and his way. And the chapter finishes like this. But you, Jeremiah, gird up your loins, stand up, put your clothes on, buckle your belt, put your shoes on, stand up and tell them everything that I command you. This they will fight against you. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not overwhelm the light. John 1, 5. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, saith the Lord, to deliver you. And we are approaching a time of trouble such as never has come upon nation, uh, this world since nations came into existence, Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Uh, some people call that Jacob's time of trouble from Jeremiah chapter 30, when God's people will once again go through attacks by spiritual Babylon. And Jesus has promised us, as he promised to Jeremiah, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jeremiah was faithful, and all of God's promises to Jeremiah came true. If we are faithful to God, all of his promises to us will come true as well, no matter what planet Earth may throw at us. God is blunt with Jeremiah. Yes, you will face opposition in ministry, but your accusers will not overwhelm you, for I am with you to deliver you. For Jeremiah and for us today, God's way is not to stop the fight, but it's to stand with the fighter in the fight. Like the disciples of Jesus today, Jeremiah is being sent out as a lamb among wolves, but the presence of God will go with him and be his protection. So what do we say in conclusion today? Well, as in the days of Jeremiah, so today. God is calling his people today to bear words of life to a world of death. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today. If any wish to live through this coming time of trouble, and we all sense our world is falling apart, and if any wish to experience God's deliverance, then his God is inviting us today to repent of our sins and to turn to God with faith and obedience. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today, a time of trouble such as never has been since nations came into existence is coming upon the entire world, including upon God's professing people. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today, there was oppression from physical Babylon back then, and there will be oppression of God's people from spiritual Babylon in these last days. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today, God's promises of eventual deliverance for his people are as sure as the blossoms that point in deepest midwinter to the joy and the renewal of spring. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today, God knows each one of us before we are born. We were handmade by God in our mother's wombs. We were uniquely fashioned by a loving creator for a heavenly purpose. And he's inviting you today to say, Lord, Show me where I fit into your master plan for humanity's salvation. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today, God sets apart those he calls. He makes them holy. He takes away our hearts of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh that delights to do his will, that has his law written upon it, that never fails to listen to watch the crowds on the streets with anything other than compassion in our hearts. Because we're looking at people without a shepherd all around us in our nation today. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today. Those whom God sends have the assurance of the personal presence of Jesus with them wherever they go. And lo, I'm with you always, says Jesus, even to the end of the earth. And our final text is this. The final struggle between good and evil, 
Revelation says, they, that is the kings of this world, will make war on the Lamb, that is on Jesus Christ and his followers on earth. And the Lamb will conquer him, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. As in the days of Jeremiah, so today. God is looking for boys and girls, men and women, to form a company described for eternity as the called, the chosen, and the faithful. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. We are called by God. He has called you. We are chosen by God to bear the gospel in this final hour of Earth's history. You are chosen by God. The only question that remains today for each one of us is, will we be faithful? I encourage you today, you are called by God, you are chosen by God, you are handmade by God. He made your character to be as it, as it is for these final days of Earth's history. You are called, you are chosen. Be faithful in whatever portion of the vineyard God has called you to serve. May God bless this congregation. May the light of his love shine throughout all that happens within these four walls in the lives of the saints gathered here today. And may people know through our lives that there is a soon coming savior who will wipe away every tear. And when he comes, death and disease and suffering will be no more. And the sea will give up her dead and we will dwell with God and he will dwell with us. And we'll eat from the tree of life and the leaves that are produced every month are for the healing of the nations. So the bitterness and the division of this world will be a thing of the past and be remembered no more. What a blessed hope we have, the coming of Jesus Christ. He's the only solution for planet Earth. We all have blood on our hands, individually in our societies, because we are guilty. Only Jesus has blood on his hands, but is innocent. Yes, he has blood on his hands, but he's innocent. That's why he can be your savior and mine. I invite you to bow your heads for a prayer of consecration this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that we are knit together in our mother's womb for a heavenly purpose. I want to thank you that each one of us is your handiwork. Father, if we need to repent of something today, then reveal that to us in your spirit. Bring us conviction of sin. Bring us conversion afresh today. And Father, I pray that as we live our lives in this coming week and month and year here in San Antonio, Texas, that you'll reveal to us our, par our part in your vineyard, You'll bring us people who you've prepared us to share the gospel with. When we're called upon to share, we claim the promise of Jesus of Mark 13, that words will be given us from on high. Father, if the Babylonians knew there was a prophet in Judah, I pray that San Antonio and Texas may know that there's a people of God in this Seventh-day Adventist church. May they know that your presence is here. May they see your presence. And Father, may they respond to the last message of mercy to this dying world that comes from these four walls and through the people gathered here this morning. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer. Father, for the food that is that we are about to eat, we thank you for that. We pray your blessing upon those who prepared it, and may you continue to abide with us through these Sabbath hours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so our final hymn is We Have This Hope. I invite you to stand, and um, I think our sing singers are going to come forward and lead us. We Have This Hope. It's a song of Christian hope and triumph from the promise that Jesus indeed is coming again. So hymn number 214, we have this hope. Shout and sing, Hallelujah! Oh. 